Hey there guys, what's up? My name is Hayden McKenzie. Welcome to episode 10 of With Hayden, aka season 2, episode 6. Yes, season 2, episode 6. So, you may notice that a few things are different with this episode. Um, for one, you can actually see me. Uh, very interesting, actually. I figured, you know what, for the 10th episode of the podcast, let's do something different. Let's do something, uh, you know, special. So, I figured... Every milestone, I don't know, 10, 25, what have you, I'll go ahead and uh, do a nice video edition like this. I think it's uh, pretty interesting. Got a pretty nice setup here. We got the Twin Peaks poster in the background, which I put up specifically for this video. We got the stack of pseudo-intellectual books here, um, and then a lovely candle to boot. So, this episode was supposed to be about Godzilla vs. Kong. And... Okay, so, basically, um, I watch the film, it comes out, I stay up late to watch it on Wednesday, March 31st, and I watch the film with my buddy Alec, shout out to Alec out there, and the movie was, it was fine, I guess, but as I was watching it, I slowly realized that, okay, there is literally nothing to talk about here, so... I panicked, okay? So, I mean, I watched the movie on Wednesday. The episode has to come out on Friday. What the hell am I going to do? So, it is now 5.15 in the morning uh, on Friday, April 2nd. And what what I've decided to do is, uh, well, not Godzilla vs. Kong at all, actually. Uh, It was really upsetting because um, I had a whole episode title planned out, all that stuff. It was going to be called Godzilla vs. Kong vs. Hayden with Hayden. Um, But that didn't quite work out. So now we're doing the lovely special episode and we are going to be talking about my top 10 favorite films. This was just a little impromptu thing that I thought of. You know, just sort of, you know, there's not really anything to do uh, for this episode. I haven't watched anything new this week. Um, So we're just going to do this. So... Uh, I've written down a list of not 10 films, but 15. Um, Now, I know what you're asking yourself right now. Hayden, you just said top 10 films. Why the hell are there 15 films in the list? You know what? My top 10 films are still here. Uh, And I wrote several iterations of this list where I tried to squeeze um, the best of the best into 10. But there were so many films that I either wanted to talk about or uh, thought deserved recognition that deserved to be on here that, uh, frankly, were not on there. So we have 15, but we're going to call it 10 because talking about my top 10 films in episode 10, I think it's pretty cool. So, um, yeah, with I mean, I can't, can't really think of anything going on uh, in movie news as of late. Um, yeah, no new trailers or anything that I can think of. Um, yeah, all like all all the all that I can really think of is the Oscars, but we covered that last episode. So, without further ado, let's just get into the top fifteen. I don't expect this to be a very long episode. Um, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the shortest one of the whole series. But we're gonna go ahead and uh, talk about it anyway. So, at number fifteen, we have Noah Baumbach's twenty nineteen film Marriage Story. So, Marriage Story is a beautiful film. Um, not just in terms of uh, the way it is shot, but in terms of pretty much every other aspect. Dialogue, uh, directing, um, I'm so goddamn tired of performances, amazing performances all the way throughout. In fact, I would go so far as to say that there is not a single weak performance in the entire film. Um, everyone does great, from Adam Driver to Alan Alda. They're all fantastic. Noah Baumbach's style of direction is pretty simplistic, but I think it fits the, the story very well. Um, yeah, everything about this film just sort of gets me emotional the second I start talking about it. Um, obviously, when this film first came out, it was memed pretty heavily for uh, the one scene towards the end, I want to say towards the third act, um, wherein Adam Driver's character, Charlie, and uh, Scarlett Johansson's character, Nicole, uh, argue and, you know, it was a long argument scene, they're yelling and things like that. Um, that was memed pretty heavily around the time of the film's release. Um, in fact, pretty heavily is an understatement. It was memed very heavily. Um, and you know what, the memes were funny, but there's a lot more to this film than just that one scene. A lot of people act like 
uh, you know what? It just had one good argument scene with some good performances. That's not the case at all. This film is chock full of amazing scenes that don't get any meme uh, meme groundswell because they're just not as memeable as two people arguing. So many great performances. I mean, every shot of this film looks gorgeous. A lot of long shots uh, I came to notice. Well, not a lot and not necessarily long either. Um, <laughs> just shots that that encompass uh what would otherwise be done uh in multiple shots traditionally of course there are also a few long shots um such as uh nicole's uh monologue about 30 minutes in the film when she's talking to laura dern's uh character um i want to say it's like a six minute long shot the camera's slowly zooming in on her uh the thing about the shots in this film um most long shots tend to draw attention to themselves in very obvious ways like ooh the camera's whooshing around and it's going up in the air and that all that's all well and good it looks great but uh what's great about this film is that everything from uh, especially in terms of the filmmaking is very subtle so the camera slowly zooms in on Nicole as she's talking about uh Charlie and and her marriage and it's it's just so beautiful and i think that scene encompasses a lot of what I love about this film. It's very quiet, um, yet heartbreaking. It somehow uh, brings light to a situation that is often not touched on very realistically in film, and that is uh, a divorce, uh, especially a very complicated one. Um, apparently, it's loosely based on uh, the director's um, like true life events, which is uh, pretty interesting. But yeah, Marriage Story, phenomenal film particular standouts in terms of performances would have to be scarlett johansson adam driver and laura dern those three are a power throuple and you know i am here for it until the very end um i'm also just uh, all right you didn't hear this you didn't hear this from me but uh, i'm kind of a slut for adam driver i mean he is so so sexy he's just so hot and you know what him being sexy is not necessarily um why I think he's a great actor, because he's a great actor regardless, even if he wasn't so hot, I think he was a great actor, um, but, I mean, it definitely adds to it, <sighs> oh my god, but yeah, Marriage Story, phenomenal, 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 I'm really, I mean, I think it was a bad idea to record this at 5 a.m., but what I really wanted to go for with this episode is a, uh, sort of a Joe Para vibe. You know that show, uh, the Adult Swim series, uh, Joe Para Talks With You? Um, just a very quiet, soft-spoken uh, stretch of time wherein I can discuss things with you, maybe talk you to sleep. If you're having trouble sleeping, put this episode on, and you know what, we'll get you sorted out real quick. And I've also, for this special episode, I have changed up the uh, music because <laughs> um, here's something funny. For the first nine episodes of the series, um, I I used the two exact same uh, thirty minute jazz playlists. Although I think I, I think I used a different one at one point in some episode. I don't know which one. It might have been the end game one. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, if you if you're watching or listening to these episodes um, chronologically, you're like binging them. Which, by the way, I don't expect you to at all. I can imagine that. I, I mean, I don't listen to the whole episodes back. Um, which is very indicative of my uh, level of effort, but God, I am just fucking unbearable to listen to, man. I I'm serious. But yeah, you may have noticed that uh, the same two 30-minute uh, jazz playlists are put on loop, apart from music that is uh, put there to match the theme of the episode. So, example, uh, using music from Tarantino films in the Tarantino episodes. Uh or the Avengers theme and the Avengers... Anyway, that's all pointless. Don't need to talk about that. But yeah, Marriage Story. Um, sorry, I keep on looking over to check the time. Uh, the, the length of the episode. See, it's great when I'm recording just audio because I'm facing my computer the whole time. Uh, and I can sort of uh, look at Audacity and look at the timestamp. But right now I'm recording in Streamlabs OBS, which is uh, very different. So I can actually see my video and the uh, timestamp and everything. Um, but yeah, uh, yes, where was I? Okay, marriage story. So, this is gonna be pretty long, I feel like I can already tell. Um, 
yeah, just beautiful film all around. I'm repeating myself, uh, touching on the cin cinematography a bit. Um, again, very subtle. It doesn't draw too much attention to itself. In fact, it's pretty simplistically shot, um, all said and done. You know, pretty much the entire film is on tripods. Um, I mean, in fact, looking back, I don't know if there's a single shot that isn't on a tripod. Um, and it gives the film a very sort of a toned down, almost like relaxed presence. Um, and I really appreciate that because it's very interesting to see such calm, still cinematography in uh, such a stressful situation, such as a complicated... Uh, nationwide coast-to-coast -coast divorce um yeah everything about this film is damn near flawless um in fact i would say the same thing about all of the films on this list that i'm going to be uh, uh showing to you today um so yeah if i had to give this film a rating i'd give it a 10 out of 10 but you know what all of these films are 10 out of 10s so i don't know what you want me to tell you so yeah number 15 marriage story number 14 is a film from 2016. We have Damien Chazelle's La La Land. Um, what can I say about this film that hasn't already been said? It's beautiful. I mean, the way that this film is shot, it's it's pretty much perfect. I, I can't think of a single complaint or flaw with this film, which is why it's on my favorites list. But, yeah, just everything about this film is done so right. And it's uh, it's rather confusing to me because... Okay, it's always weird to watch a movie that is so good that it makes you literally angry, and this film and another film on this list uh, definitely do that pretty well. Um, but La La Land, yes. The music is amazing, gets stuck in your head the moment you listen to it. I mean, if, if you remember when the film was coming out, City of Stars did not stop playing for at least like eight months, no matter where you went. There was always the band kids going, oh, City of Stars, shut the fuck up. Anyway... <laughs> The two lead performances in this film, of course, Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling, are two of the best lead performances I've ever consumed in any piece of media ever. Um, they really, R Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone, do a really good job of just becoming their characters. The second they become a part of the role, they are the role. There's absolutely nothing between them and, and the raw emotion of the character, and I can really appreciate that. Um, as someone who is a bit of an amateur actor themselves, uh, if you couldn't tell from Sex Ed or uh, the Mortal Kombat skit, <laughs> God, that was terrible. It's uh, acting in a film is a much more difficult job than one might expect. Um, not that I've ever done any professional acting, but even trying to deliver dialogue in a semi-serious skit, you know, it's very hard to have that dialogue roll off your tongue and have it uh, sound realistic or convincing. Just the amount of uh, dedication it takes to learning that craft is insane, and it, it makes the film so much more immersive. Just beautifully shot, so colorful, so many long extended takes. In fact, pretty much every musical number is a series of long takes of two, three, five, six minutes apiece. Just absolutely glorious. And then this film does the pleasure of uh, giving me an ending that makes me cry every single time. Wow, who would have guessed? Yeah, <laughs> beautiful film. I absolutely adore it. Um, so yeah, La La Land, 10 out of 10. I talked about that for a lot less time than I talked about Marriage Story. But then again, I got off on like a five-minute tangent, so it doesn't matter. Number 13, we have a film from 2018. We actually have a remake from 2018. This will be the only remake featured on the list. Um, it's Suspiria. So Suspiria was directed by Luca Guadagnino. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but a particular standout in this film is that it had a uh, original score done by none other than Tom York, aka the lead singer of Radiohead. So um, going into this film, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I haven't seen... <laughs> I haven't seen the original Suspiria, which is uh, kind of funny. But that being said, I loved this film. Um, this is very similar to uh, Marriage Story, at least in terms of the way it's shot. Um, very simplistic, uh, in a sense anyway. There are some very uh, complex and uh, obviously very unsettling scenes um, throughout this film. Um, I'm not going to try and spoil it for you because it's still a... 
relatively new movie. Um, but yeah, there's, there's uh, so much here that I haven't seen in any other film before. I mean, from what I've seen with the original film, it's basically an entire, it's, it's an entirely different film, you know, it's, where the original film was very colorful and vibrant, this film is very dull uh, and and very quiet. And I'm just so totally for that in every aspect. I mean, so much about this film is total polar opposites. Like, f- somehow the film is both, like, fascinating and engaging and yet almost, like, a little boring <laughs> at the same time. I don't know how to explain it, really. But that's 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 pretty much the best way that I can explain it. Um, it's both interesting and boring at the same time because this is this is not a short film. This film's two and a half hours long, and sure, maybe it could have been cut down. But at the same time, I can't think of a single scene that this film doesn't need. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous movie. Uh, not just in terms of being shot, uh, but in terms of every other part about it. The screenplay is fascinating. It delivers exposition in a, in a pretty interesting way. Um, it conveys information that needs to be conveyed without uh, getting too boring. Um, part of that could be in the fact that the concept itself is incredibly interesting. Uh, another part of that could be the writing. So, who knows? Um, this film also has one of the most memorable lead performances of all time. That, of course, being Tilda Swinton in three roles in the film. Um, she, of course, plays... Uh, oh, God... What the hell? I'm forgetting all three of their names. Mother Marcos. Marco? Marcos? Marcos. Mother Marcos. Um, Blanc. Madame Blanc. And the old man. (laughs) Uh, Absolutely fascinating. I mean, part of me doesn't even know why they went with that choice. But, um, yeah, just an absolutely amazing choice. Tilda Swinton is just so dedicated as an actress. Uh, I think she's one of the best actresses working today. And I'm very happy that she gets work consistently. Um, just fascinating. The the number of languages that she speaks in this film. She speaks Russian, German, and English. Which apparently she spoke all three of those before the film was even made. I, I have no idea. And apparently there was another film that she was in. Also directed by Luca Guadagnino. Uh, which I haven't seen. And I can't remember the name off the top of my head right now. But apparently she learned... Uh, what was it? She learned Russian and Italian so she could speak Russian with an Italian accent. That's, like, what the hell? The, the amount of dedication that you need as an actress or actor. You know, the term actress is nonsensical, as uh, the, one, the one lady said in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, the amount of dedication that you need as an actor to go to that length, to go to those lengths, purely to immerse the viewer is fascinating, and I will never not admire that. Um, Luca Guadagnino's direction is uh, phenomenal, as it was in Call Me By Your Name, which it's fascinating to me that, I think I'm saying the word fascinating a lot, I'm sorry, um, it's fascinating to me that he directed uh, Call Me By Your Name and then this, two very different films, um, but yeah, it's 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 a beautiful film, definitely not for the faint of heart, um, it's uh, actually rather sickening at times in terms of how disturbing it is, um, so yeah, Six acts and an epilogue set in divided Berlin. Something I might be paraphrasing that a little bit, but um, yeah, amazing movie. Ten out of ten. Uh, yeah, that's number thirteen. So number thirteen, Suspiria. Number twelve, two thousand and one, A Space Odyssey. Um, again, really not much to say about this movie that hasn't already been said. Uh, it's one of the most gorgeous films ever made. One of the most technologically advanced films ever made. Uh, In fact, one of the claims that's made rather frequently about this film is that the visual effects in this film look better than some of the stuff that's even coming out today, and this was done long before computer-generated effects. Um, This is all entirely matte paintings and miniatures and models and front-screen projection and all of that, and it's aged so well. It's aged like a fine wine, especially, especially the the front-screen projection. That still amazes me because it looks so real. Um, I think to the uh, opening chapter of the film, The Dawn of Man, everything involving the uh, ape characters was shot on soundstage. And seeing that and seeing how seamlessly the foreground blends into the background, it's astounding to me. 
Um, I, I, I've never really seen anything quite like it. Um, of course, Stanley Kubrick's direction is, uh, it's, it's obviously a characteristic at this point that his direction is very cold, uh, stylized, you know, symmetrical, um, and very slow. This film is very slow. Um, in fact, it's, it ties into Suspiria in that way, in that, uh, it's a great movie, yet somehow I'm bored. <laughs> now, saying the 2001 is boring is, uh, almost sacrilegious in some circles. I'm not in that circle. Um, me personally, I don't, I, I mean, I like to think that I don't have very pre pretentious opinions on film. Um, but then again, the fact that I call them films and not movies is, uh, a clear indicator that that might not be true. But, like I was saying, uh, <laughs> Stanley Kubrick um, was very dedicated to his craft, but at the same time, he was not dedicated to making necessarily uh, accessible films, at least in terms of the uh, modern standard. So I guess what I mean by that is his films were very long and they were very slow. They took their time to establish the narrative and they did not hold your hand in the explanation of, of anything, really. And, uh, you know, that's fascinating to me really um yeah it's it's uh as a result the film is very long it's about two and a half hours long and uh it's very slow there there are scenes that go on for eight nine minutes at a time without dialogue uh sometimes even without sound um and you are fully expected to immerse yourself into the environment to immerse yourself into the reality of the film and that definitely happens with me every time I watch it. Every time I watch it, I sort of snap into this state of... It's almost like cinematic hypnosis or something. Um, I don't really... I, I think Chris Stuckman did a video on this, uh, which is probably where I got the term from. But, yeah, it's... it's. I mean, I, I've called every film in this list so far beautiful, but this is a film that is genuinely beautiful in, in terms of the way that it is shot. Um in terms of the way that it that it looks, it sounds, everything about it is just perfect. And yeah, like I say, there's really not much that I can say about this film that hasn't already been said. For the last four minutes, I've been retreading on everything that everyone in the world who has seen this film has already said. So yeah, number 12, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Number 11, we have Irreversible. Oh man, um, I don't even know where to begin with a film like Irreversible. Um, yeah, I mean, talk about disturbing. You thought Suspiria was disturbing. You have not seen anything yet. Um, now, this film was directed by Gaspar Noé. It was released in 2001 or 2002. I think it depends on uh, which region you, uh, you, you look at. I think in the States it was 2002. Uh, in France, it was 2001, I'm not sure, but anyway, this is a French film, uh, in fact, one of the first feature-length films by Gaspar Noé, uh, maybe even his second, I'm not sure, um, I love Gaspar Noé with all my heart, and to the Void and Climax were very close contenders for this list, but I figured, um, you know, I want to show appreciation for a list of filmmakers, um, and... So, you know, I was like, okay, sat down, took those three films, which I love, and chose the one that I like the best, which is Irreversible. So, for those of you who don't know uh, the sort of concept of this film, I'll go ahead and try and explain it for you um, without spoiling the film in any way. So, this film is a, is a classic uh, sort of, t it's, a, it's a spin on the revenge story uh, archetype. And basically what happens is this woman is uh, raped uh, and, and, and violated in uh, a tunnel. And her boyfriend, uh, by the way, the woman played by the wonderful Monica Bellucci, and her boyfriend played by Oliver something? Oliver? I, Oliver? I don't... You know, I don't remember. I'll probably put the name on screen if I remember. Um... Uh, but yeah, basically her boyfriend is dead set on getting revenge um, and, and, and punishing the man who did it. Uh, now, that's a very simple concept on its own. However, the big spin on it is the whole narrative is told in reverse. 
So scenes uh, take place from beginning to end. However, the overall narrative starts at the end and goes to the beginning, uh, which is fascinating. And the narrative is, is shaped in such a way where um, you find out more as the film goes on, uh, despite being thrown into the back end of it. And it actually makes the whole tragedy of the film much more upsetting by the end of it. And it, it, this film, this film's kind of infamous for uh, what can only be described as a 10 minute unbroken rape scene. Um, it's, it's about as horrific as it sounds. It's honestly quite uh, traumatizing. In fact, the first time I saw this film, I had to pause and, and take a break for about 30 minutes. I had to get up and walk around because I physically almost could not handle what I was seeing. It's, uh, it's a part of the French New Wave extremist movement, I believe is what it's called. Um, and yeah, it's, it's haunting. It's genuinely haunting. Um, and a lot of that is due to the performance. Um, the performance of it is unreal. I, I mean, I, I can't even get into the headspace of, of actors who perform scenes like this, you know? I mean, I respect any and all actors. And, and it's scenes like this that, that just sort of make me both appreciate the form more and also question the, uh, not necessarily integrity. I don't really know what I'm trying to say. Well, I know what I'm trying to say. I don't know the words for it. It's just fascinating to me to see the actors get into this headspace, get into these characters and film such a traumatizing, uh, horrific scene without being somewhat traumatized themselves. Um, and yes, a lot of the horrific qualities of, of the scene and the film in general um, can be accredited to the actors. Another part of it could be accredited to, to uh, the direction. Now, from what I've heard, Gaspar Noé is uh, sort of a weirdo. Um, <laughs> in fact, I was reading interviews uh, and, and, and just press on, on this film in general after I saw it. And Gaspar Noé was uh, on coke throughout the production of this film because uh, the whole film is made to look like one continuous shot. And as a result, there's a lot of tracking shots. So that involves a man holding a steady cam, which is a very heavy rig, straps onto your body, it's like 80 pounds, and you're carrying that around constantly, moving that with the characters uh, around large spaces. So the only way that Gaspar Noé could keep going is uh, by, by doing coke, I guess. Um, and you know what? I don't support the use of uh, any recreational drugs in any way. Um, but you gotta respect the hustle. I mean, come on now. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying anymore. It's nearly six in the morning. Wow, this is already getting really long. Okay. Um, and yeah, so the scene itself is one continuous shot. It does not cut away and it does not let up. Though the violence and the shocking aspects of this film, I don't feel as though it's there just purely to shock people. Um, because if that were the case, the film would not be as uh, artistically intact as I believe it is. Um, in fact, if you ask me, I think this is probably one of the best looking films I've ever seen. Um, the one shot aspect of it is fascinating, uh, especially the crane shots where the crane flies around the space and it reaches like impossible angles that I never would have uh, imagined it could reach. Um, yeah, very, very uh, interesting cinematography from a guy whose name I can't remember. That sucks. I do remember that he did the cinematography for Spring Breakers, though. So do with that as you will. So yeah, I gotta start speaking this up here or else this is gonna be the same length as the Snyder Cut episode. So, number 12, uh, number 11, Irreversible. Number 10, we have Magnolia. This film came out in 1999 and was directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, in fact, this is the first of two Paul Thomas Anderson films on this list. I know I said I wanted to give uh, some some credit or, or shine a spotlight on uh, multiple directors, but these two films were so goddamn good that I couldn't help but put them both on the list. So Magnolia is uh, the follow-up to Paul Thomas Anderson's previous film, Boogie Nights, which was a big success. Um, it made quite a bit of money. It was a, a critical sweetheart and uh, did a, a very fine job. And that's a great film. Don't get me wrong. Um, but what I think Magnolia does 
<clears throat> and what I think it does better than Boogie Nights um, is it takes the more character-driven aspects of that film and really plays on it more. And what it, it, it especially does is it, it takes on the ensemble aspect and plays on that more. So what you have is an ensemble piece character study that goes into the psyches and uh, emotions and daily trials and tribulations of nine characters. It's uh, it's fascinating to watch fold out, to, 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 to watch unfold, I mean. Um, I was thinking of play out and unfold at the same time. It's weird. Um, it's, a, it's, it's fascinating to watch unfold because effectively what you, what you, what you end up with, with is this long, epic, sprawling piece um, of cinema that uh, is, is very much focused on the sort of strange anomalies of everyday life. Um, in fact, the first 10 minutes of the film are very much dedicated to that. In fact, they even have a narrator explaining, uh, possibly real, I don't know if they're real life situations or not, uh, explaining situations of very fascinating, strange, rare occurrences that seem like uh, they should be coincidences. But no, these things happen all the time. Um, yeah, amazing film. Uh, particular standouts would be uh, Julianne Moore, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and, uh, oh, who the hell? Oh, who the hell? William H. Macy. Yes, William H. Macy is such a great actor. I'm in the process of watching Shameless right now. I'm currently on season nine. I can't speak for the quality of the show, because it has certainly gone downhill in the last couple of seasons, but William H. Macy is the face of that show, and he is, quite frankly, the face of my heart. I love that man to death. I would do anything for him. I would die for for William H. Macy. Yeah, lovely film. William H. Macy does an amazing job. Um, in fact, it's, it's uh, quite interesting to see him as an actor compared to him as a person, because he's this, like, very quiet, soft-spoken, polite Catholic man in real life. No, not Catholic. Lutheran, I believe. Lutheran? I don't know. He's religious. Um, and then in this film, he plays a uh, gay uh, electronics store clerk um, who was once the quiz kid uh, on, on a game show in the 60s. Um, and, and the whole film takes place over the span of a single day. Uh, he goes to a bar, and he, he is madly in love with the bartender, the male bartender with braces, um, and at the beginning of the film, he gets fired from his job, uh, but he needs money. He needs $5,000 to get braces, even though his teeth, are, his, his, teeth, his teeth are perfectly straight. Um, yeah, lovely film. Just fascinating, in-depth look, looks at, at, at characters, at illness, at, at family. Yeah, unforgettable. Absolutely unforgettable. I'll be watching this film several more times in my lifetime. So, number 10, Magnolia. We are 34 minutes in, and we just now got to the top 10. Uh, number 9, Zodiac. From 2007, directed by David Fincher. I had not seen this film until, I want to say, like two weeks ago, which uh, is interesting. But already this film has cemented itself as one of my favorites of all time. Um... There's really not much that I can say about this film, uh, purely because I want anyone who hasn't seen this film to go in completely blind. What I can say is that all three of the lead performances, that being Jake Gyllenhaal, Robert Downey Jr., and Mark Ruffalo, are phenomenal. And David Fincher's direction is very unique, very stylized, and uh, incredible. Fits the story perfectly. And there's a lot of twists and turns in there that I would not have expected. Um... That's about all I can say about this film, really. Um, also a great soundtrack as well. It takes place in the 60s and 70s. Great soundtrack. Um, in fact, my favorite song in this film is uh, Hurdy Gurdy Man by Donovan. I had heard this song beforehand, and then I was watching this movie with a few friends, and basically the song plays at the beginning and the end of the movie. And at the beginning of the movie, um, it was very much like how we are now. Uh, I, I had to be quiet. There's someone right on the other side of this wall sleeping who has work early in the morning and uh the song came on and i got really close to the microphone and i said is that the fucking hurdy gurdy man 
and it was. Great song. If you don't want to watch the movie, it's pretty long. Listen to that song. It's very good. So yeah, Zodiac, number nine. Number eight, Apocalypse Now, 1979, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Holy shit, man. Okay, so... I always used to look at Apocalypse Now as a fairly by-the-books war drama with a hefty dose of stylistic flair. But upon further rewatches and upon my, my view on not only this film or films in general, but the world matures, this is, this is, this is a flat-out horror movie. You know, it's a psychological horror movie. There's nothing that you can say to change my mind. It uh, goes very far in depth with the effects that, that uh, wartime has on a human um, in multiple scenarios. Uh, in one, it made a man go crazy and turn into a cult leader. In another one, it made a man go crazy and beg to want to go back to the military to, uh, you know, and, and, and not only does it show the effects of, of psychosis, but uh, PTSD. PTSD setting in even while the war is still going on. Um, yeah, absolutely fascinating. Another one of those films that's been talked about to death for the last nearly 50 years. There's really not much that I could say about it. Um, other than Francis Ford Coppola's direction is phenomenal. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. Um, in fact, I'd say that this film is better than The Godfather, which I don't know if that's a popular opinion or not, but that's just how I feel. It's absolutely gorgeous to look at. The actors were put into very harsh conditions and uh, not treated nicely. Um, in fact, I don't think anybody in this film was treated nicely throughout the whole production. Um, uh, I have the 4K Blu-ray set, um, which you saw in my Blu-ray collection video. If you watched that, it was really long. I don't blame me if you didn't. Um, and it comes with the documentary Hearts of Darkness, uh, which was a made-for-TV documentary about the making of the film. Uh, and I really need to check that out because that that seems very interesting. And I've done some reading on it, just looking at the uh, Wikipedia page uh, and things like that. And, yeah, this seems like it was a total nightmare to shoot. And Francis Ford Coppola has enough footage to recut the film until he dies. Um, in fact, that was actually an idea that I had for an episode of the podcast that I may do down the road. Um, I was going to watch every single cut of Apocalypse Now, one after the other after the other after the other. In fact, there's four. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. That seems like it would be very exhausting. Um, it might be another case of what I did with the Tarantino episode where I'm like, oh yeah, this is going to come out next week. And then it took me a month and a half to make it. But, um, yeah, I, do, I, I don't know. That's certainly interesting. So number eight, Apocalypse Now. Number seven, we have Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood from 2007. God damn, man. Never before has a film put me on the edge of my seat, lifted me outside of merely watching a film to fully immersing me in the environment that the film takes place in. This movie is an absolute masterpiece. And I'm not afraid to say that. Uh, from Daniel Day-Lewis's insane lead performance that has has gone down in history already, despite the film only being out for some 14 years, uh, to the story involved, which was based off of a novel written by Upton Sinclair, um, yeah, everything about this movie just works so goddamn well, uh, to the point where I could sit down and watch this movie right now, even at six o'clock in the morning, I could sit down, watch this movie, not have any regrets about it, God damn it, I love it, um, but yeah, to talk more on Daniel Day-Lewis's, uh, performance, he obviously won the Oscar for it, uh, rightfully so, I think this is probably the best performance I've ever seen in any film, um, he really just steals the character and runs off with it, man. He does so much incredible work in front of the camera. So much in terms of, uh, analyzing the accent, going into the history of the character, uh, how people lived back then. You know, it's, it's fascinating. And what, what it ends up with, what you end up with is one of the most fascinating and immersive exhibitions of character that I have ever seen. So, there will be blood. Give that a 10 out of 10. Number 7. Number 6, we have An Elephant Sitting Still. 
This was a 2018 film, and it is the only uh, directorial, uh, well, fe- this is the only direct uh, feature-length film by Chinese director Hu Bo. Um, tragically, Hu Bo committed suicide in 2018 before the film was finished, um, or before the film was released, I mean. Um, and I've never seen... I'm I'm getting emotional talking about it. I've never seen such a raw and pure and and unadulterated exhibit of real personal emotion in a film. Um there's films later in this list, in fact the next film in this list that definitely come close to it, but this film an elephant sitting still is so clearly personal and so clearly human. Um, basically, the film is four hours long and is set in an unnamed city in uh, China. And what it mainly examines is effects of the uh, Industrial Revolution. And uh, it, it, it takes a peek at characters of uh, several different age groups um, looking at the, uh, the lower class. Um, and the whole, the, the titular character of the movie is the rumor is there is a, an elephant in a, a nearby city that sits still and is totally, uh, totally clueless about the troubles of the world. And all of these characters wish to be that elephant. And you could tell that Hubo wished to be that elephant. Um, in fact, this film is based off of a short story that he wrote. Um, yeah, I mean powerful man absolutely powerful this movie is four hours long you could have told me that it was two and a half and i would have believed you i mean holy shit man so much of this movie just works so well it's it's an unforgettable experience and i'm not saying much about it because there is not much that i can say about it without uh giving too much away um it's it's almost like magnolia in a sense in that it follows a a large ensemble cast over the span of a single day, um, just sort of showing a very impactful and tumultuous day in these characters' lives. Um, I highly recommend that you watch this. It's honestly one of the most unique, uh, film-going, movie-going experiences that I've ever had. So, yeah, An Elephant Sitting Still. Number five, we're in the, we're in the top five here, boys. Uh, we have Synecdoche, New York, a 2008 film directed by Charlie Kaufman. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Charlie Kaufman uh, wrote films such as Being John Malkovich, which very nearly made this list, um, Adaptation, and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Those are his three most known films. And of course, Chaos Walking. It's kind of weird. <laughs> that really is kind of weird. But anyway... Tying back into what I was saying about an elephant sitting still, um, this is another exhibit uh, of, of, or example rather, of such raw and pure emotion and personal experience put into a film. Synecdoche, New York is a very ambitious film that deals with a lot of themes going on at once. Um, Fear of death, uh, fear of purpose, um, love, you know, not not fulfilling your your life's uh, goal or your life's purpose before you die. The inevitability of death, all of it is so incredibly powerful. And while it is personal to the filmmaker, it's also very diverse and and broad and can reach out to any one viewer. I I feel, um, yeah, absolutely unreal in terms of of just the straight the straight up majesty that goes behind the screenwriting behind the directing there are so many different layers to this film so many different things to pick apart there's a puzzle actively going on within the film that you as the viewer are tasked with uh deciphering and charlie kaufman does not hold your hand in breaking this apart um this is a very heady movie this is a very complex movie. There's a lot going on. It takes place over a very long period of time. In fact, I'm amazed that this film is only two hours long, and it manages to fit as much as it does within the runtime. 
because not a single line of dialogue is wasted. Not one shot is without meaning. It's phenomenal in every sense of the word. If you haven't seen this film, I'd say clear out a day and then sit down and watch it because it is very depressing. Um, if you couldn't tell from my description of it, very depressing. Um, and in fact, nowadays I'd say a lot of that is characterized by the lead performance from none other than Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, given the film's themes and, and a lot of the things that, that it deals with, having Philip Seymour Hoffman in the role, not having the foresight of his fate, is it's it's gut -re it's gut wrenching to even think about honestly, I I yeah, unreal. So yeah, Synecdoche, New York. Please watch it. You you will not regret it. Number four, we have Parasite, directed by Bong Joon Ho, or Joon Ho Bong, whichever one from 2019. This film is unreal, man. I mean, it sort of invented a genre. It, it melded so many different genres together, took inspiration from so many things, yet somehow managed to, be, to, to, to remain so inexplicably original. Um, I mean, I'll say it right now, it's, it's one of the best films ever made. It is currently the highest rated film on Letterboxd of all time, the, the whole platform, the number one highest rated film. Um, and frankly, I think it deserves it in many ways. Um, this was the first foreign film to win Best Picture at the Oscars. Or, or sorry, Best International Film, I suppose. Um, God damn, this is going to be a long episode. I'm sorry, boys. Um, yeah, absolutely lovely film. There's nothing that I can say about it that hasn't already been said over the past couple of years. This film has been t talked about to death. Um, and you know what? If you ask me... I would say that there is no better way to go in this film, into this film than going in completely blind. If you haven't seen this film, the preferred way to watch it is by seeing the poster and nothing else and just jumping right into the deep end of it because I assure you the experience is unlike anything you've ever seen. Number three, we have Sergio Leone's 1984 epic Once Upon a Time in America. Wow, man. Talk about... I mean, when I, when I say epic, this movie is fucking epic. It is the very definition of the word. Um, basically, this film follows uh, a gangster, played by Robert De Niro, uh, all the way from his youth... Uh, I, don't, I don't know how old exactly. All the way into old age. This film is nearly four and a half hours long. Um, although I haven't seen that cut of the film, actually. I should point that out. I have not seen the extended cut of this film. Um, I have it on Blu-ray, and I've tried, I've tried to sit down to watch it. Um, however, I never made it past the intermission, because it's just so goddamn long. Um, but, that being said, this film is so unbelievably breathtaking in so many ways. Its scope is massive, its ambition is large. Not one stone goes unturned in terms of analyzing this man's psyche, this man's life. Um, there's a lot of things that I want to talk about, but I don't want to be here for another two hours. Uh, so I'm really just trying to do just a general overview. Robert De Niro gives a career-defining performance, in my opinion. Um, in fact, this film actually bears a lot of resemblance to The Irishman. Um, in fact, they're very, they're very much um, similar films just different time periods um the irishman the irishman sorry um follows post world war ii into the early 2000s whereas um oh god i just lost my train of thought whereas once upon a time in america deals with uh the 1910s and 1920s all the way into uh the 80s so yeah very fascinating film uh, goes all the way from prohibition into uh, the more modern age. And there's actually a great scene towards the beginning of the film that exemplifies how much everything has changed, where Robert De Niro is in a train station. Um, and the film has a nonlinear structure, so it keeps cutting between three different timelines uh, of him at three different points in his life. And uh, there is uh, this, I, I believe it, 
I, I don't know which train station it is. It's in New York. Um, but there's this wall with a mural on it with a glass door. He goes into the glass door, shuts it, comes back out as an old man. The wall is different. Everything about the set is different. Such an ambitious movie. So many scenes, so many sets, such a dense script. I, I mean, oh my god, this, this is the type of movie that inspired me to not only get into movies uh, or films, but uh, want to make films myself. So yeah, Once Upon a Time in America. Number two, we have a second Damien Chazelle film on here. We have 2014's Whiplash. My god, talk about absolute pulse-pounding rectum destroying action man wow i mean this film is only an hour and 40 minutes um but you could have told me that it was like 45 and i probably would have believed you um this film is incredibly fast-paced and incredibly angry this is another one of those films that's so good that it makes me angry um and i mean jesus christ J.K. Simmons gives a, a performance to define a hundred careers. Absolutely breathtaking, uh, as does Miles Teller. He does a very good job as the two uh, focal points of the film. They both do amazing jobs. Um, Damien Chazelle is uh, a man who is incredibly interested in not only music, but also filmmaking. So his, his uh, films, or at least the ones that I've seen of his, are very music-oriented. I have not seen First Man, although I do want to. Um, his films are very music oriented whiplash obviously being about a student uh, of, of, of musical arts and La La Land being a musical um, obviously he has a deep passion for the films that he's making and that is incredibly admirable um, so the filmmaking is stylish it's slick it's uh, not without style uh, I already said stylish. My God, I'm repeating myself so much. I am so sorry, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, everything about it, man, it's just phenomenal. Um, yeah, there's not much that I can think about that I can, that I can think to say about it right now. Um, Whiplash, amazing film. And finally, 53 minutes later, we are at number one. My number one all-time favorite film. This little movie you might have heard of. 2014's Birdman, directed by Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu. Uh, hope you hope I'm pronouncing your your name right, Alejandro. Uh, if I'm not, feel free to leave a comment down below. Um, <laughs> yes, what can I say about Birdman? It's exceptional in style, exceptional in tone. A very engrossing story that is rather simple. In fact, I'd say that this film, this film is about uh, theater, not cinema, but theater. Um, more importantly, it's about uh, a washed up celebrity trying to reconnect with his uh, long lost career. Um, and the way that he does that is by adapting a book into a play, writing, directing, starring in it himself, producing as well, I believe. Um, and it sort of just shows a rather realistic depiction of uh, a, a well, oh god, what's the name of the the one track on the off the soundtrack? Um, what is it? The anxious battle for sanity. That's what it is. Um, this film depicts an anxious battle for sanity, and. I mean, really, there's no better way to describe the film than that. This this man has put his life, his blood, sweat, and tears into this one last-ditch effort to become validated again. Um, and not only does it show how fucked up show business is, but it shows how fucked up humans are. This man so desperately wants to be validated that he puts his entire life at stake, his entire career at stake. Um, and I can't help but adore it, man. Michael Keaton does an amazing job in the lead role um in fact everyone does a great job edward norton emma stone uh naomi watts zach galifianakis i mean i i never would have expected that but yeah birdman not much i could say about it uh without giving too much away if you haven't seen this film 
Go watch it right now. Amazing film. And with that being said, those are my top 15 films, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. I can't believe this. Um, it has been 56 minutes, by the way I'm looking at it. Uh, wow. Yeah, I don't know why I did this uh, so late at night. <laughs> but that'll do it for this episode, ladies and gentlemen. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe, comment something. Um, comment what you want to see in future episodes, honestly. Um, because, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to talk about new movies every time. Um, in fact, there is something that I've been wanting to do um, as a sort of... Uh, just a sort of random occurrence thing where I want to randomize a list of uh, like a wheel with every uh, film on my letterbox watch list and uh, pick one at, pick, pick a list of films out from the watch list films that I've never seen before going completely cold and then uh, talk about those on the podcast I think that'd be pretty interesting in fact I came up with a name for it the watch list gauntlet so if you want to see the watch list gauntlet anytime soon leave a comment down below um and yeah just let me know what you want to see out of this series because i'm still having a great time making the show um and i know that not many people actually listen to it but i am very thankful for those who do your support means a lot to me uh it means more than you can actually know just knowing that me talking to myself is heard by at least a few people really warms my heart so yeah, that's, uh, that's this episode, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed. Like, comment, subscribe, all of that. I will see you all in the next episode. Why the fuck did I do this?